The viewpoints expressed on Night Fright are not necessarily those of the host, the staff, the sponsors, or the affiliate stations. Tonight's program may contain graphic themes or images. Viewer discretion is advised. There is a time for question. There is a time for answers. There is a time for challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Showtime. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland and welcome to Night Fright. Somber Eve out there tonight, folks. You know, as I drove into the studio, the clouds are low and it's really overcast. So I'm not sure if it's going to rain. Probably. I just hope there's no more snow this year. I hope we're past that. Not to worry, though, because we've got an incredible guest with new explosive revelations surrounding the JFK assassination autopsy. For example, was the body removed from the casket on board Air Force One before it departed from Dallas? Was there more than one autopsy? Was the autopsy purposely botched in order to conceal evidence of a conspiracy? What elite military personnel were front row and present at the autopsy? Have autopsy x-rays, and this is very serious stuff, been tampered with? Were there two coffins, one empty, the other with Kennedy's body? Did a helicopter actually take off behind Air Force One once it landed at Andrews Air Force Base? Now, who was aware and running the show? These are some of the questions that we're going to be looking at tonight with our guest, William Madsen Law, with his new book called In the Eye of History, Disclosures in the JFK Assassination, Medical Evidence. Now, just let me back up here for a second. November 22nd, 1963, President John F. Kennedy has just rounded the corner of Houston to head down Elm Street. Ominously, he passes in front of the Texas School Book Depository. <coughs> just ahead to his right, is what's going to become famously known as, you know, the grassy knoll. Now the shots ring out and a flurry of bullets pass inside the limousine, fatally wounding the president and hitting Governor Connolly with life-threatening wounds. Now arriving at Trauma Room 1 at Parkland Hospital, medical personnel <coughs> witness a wound in JFK's throat, described as an entrance wound. They also witness the back of JFK's head blown out. At the proclamation of President Kennedy's death, the body is wrapped and placed in a bronze casket. What happens next is exactly where we're going to go tonight. The JFK body and the official autopsy, or maybe autopsies, plural. William Law returns to join us tonight with an update in his groundbreaking book, in the eye of history, disclosures in the JFK assassination medical evidence, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's guest book cover. We'll take you right to a spot where you can order the book from the comfort of your own home. So get the coffee going, get the tea going, get a beverage of choice going, comforters on the comfy chair, kick your legs back, relax. <coughs> We're going to take you on one heck of a ride tonight, as always. Essentially, what William's done, to the great advantage for us all, he's gone around and interviewed first-person witnesses who were there beside the president in Bethesda before, during, and after the assassination. 
Fans of this show will know that William Law has been a researcher of the Kennedy assassination for over 25 years. So he started when he was one and is a frequent speaker at JFK conferences. It's my pleasure to welcome back with a great big smile on his face, William Matson Law. How you doing, buddy? It's good to see you I'm again. I'm good, Brent. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, the updated version. This is terrific. And it's been some time in coming. I bet. I bet. Okay, can you take us from Trauma Room 1, they've just loaded the body into the bronze casket, as I mentioned. What happens next? Because this seems to be a mystery, and your book seems to explain this mystery. Well, you know, I've always hated to come to conclusions. I just wanted to collect the information as I could collect it and let other people make up their mind. But in the years since I've been doing this, I found I had to come to some conclusions. And I think that David Lifton, who did Best Evidence mm -hmm. back in the 80s, and Doug Horn uh, the, in his uh, series of books, are closer to the truth of what happened to the body than not. Uh, the body was taken from the, uh, by ambulance and placed aboard the plane. Now you say, what, who could have bothered the body at that point? Uh, I talked to a fellow that I'm calling the White House witness in the book uh, because he did not in any way, shape, or form want to be identified. Who the, he said, who you, the heck can blame he, him? He said, you can, you can uh, tell my story. You can, uh, I'll tell you all about it, but you cannot tell where in the United States I live. You cannot give my name. And I, and I kept that, and I've kept that for a number of years now. He helped load the casket aboard the plane, and he says there was a body inside the casket you could feel by the weight. But I believe at some point, either right before the swearing-in or during the swearing-in, the body was indeed taken off on the opposite side of the cameras. I believe the body was taken a very short distance and placed in the compartment under the plane. And I believe at that point, uh, when it landed at Andrews, it was shortly thereafter taken off uh, there by people that were in the know, probably Secret Service agents or others, and placed aboard a helicopter and helicoptered in. William, any I know it's all speculation, but any idea yeah. who would do that dastardly deed? Who would open the coffin up, lift the body well, out? Doug Horn says that, that uh, the, the Secret Service agents that took the body out did this because they were scared to death after the struggle with Earl Rose that they were going to come and get the body, and that may be very well true. Um, I really don't know, but you can you can bet it had to be people high up in the either Secret Service agents, somebody that knew. I mean, this wasn't done by magic; it was a human act. And then they took the body uh, and flew it to the grounds of Bethesda, uh, where I think the O'Neill, uh, not the O'Neill Funeral Home, but the Gallers Funeral Home people, right. probably had. Uh, uh, the black Cadillac hearse there. It was placed in the black Cadillac hearse and then taken and delivered to the back of the morgue uh, at about 635 as per Dennis David and Roger Boygen. So, William, when, when Air Force One lands at um, Andrews Air Force Base in D.C., everybody hears that helicopter, the rotors going right. in the background right. whenever we see that news clip. That was the helicopter that you believe the body was put on and then... Well, I can't say that for certain. Okay. I can't, but I do I do believe, given what we know, it's the only thing that makes sense, because the timeline does not allow you for enough time to do anything else, really. And yeah. uh, uh, th th I believe that's what happened. I'm doing further investigation, further work in this with other people. Right. Hopefully we'll have more clear answers, but that's the best I can give you at this point. Okay. So the body arrives at Bethesda via... Let's presume, let's just go on the assumption that it's by helicopter, gets loaded into a black hearse. What's coming out the front end, or I should say the tail end of Air Force One at this point? Because as I remember the, uh, the movie, uh, the movie, I'm sorry, the news clip, um, there seems to me Bobby was there, um, mm -hmm. Jackie was there. They were lowering it down on some kind of uh, X-shaped. Yes, uh, it, was on a, it was on a cargo lift. Yeah. It was on some sort of platform. And then at that point, uh, the honor guard was there. They'd been waiting for about 15 minutes. They flew in a helicopter ahead and landed about 15 minutes ahead 
So they were already there by the time the plane landed. They were supposed to take the casket and put it into the ambulance. And uh, Hugh Clark tells me, and you can see it in the film, he gets down to handle the casket. And the, the, the reporters and things rushed in, and the people that were there uh, tried to carry the casket, and they almost dropped it. They almost dropped it right there. And uh, Hugh almost got crushed. He barely made it out of not getting crushed by the casket. You should so, tell folks who Hugh is, because this Hugh is a Clark, coup on your part. Hugh Clark was one of the honor guard that took President Kennedy's body to Arlington Cemetery. Wow. You can see him in the old film, and you know, with the drum. I have interviewed him, and we're now working on a book. So Great work. We, we can get into that more later if you'd like. Yeah. So they almost so dropped it. I didn't. They wow. almost dropped it. Now he said, "You said to me that all these people came rushing forward, and they were supposed to get in a truck and follow the ambulance, but the ambulance takes off. So they get in the truck hurriedly. They're trying to follow this ambulance, but they lose the ambulance. So they go around. They go around the grounds, and and Bethesda Naval Hospital is a huge complex." So he said, we don't know how long we're out there. He says, it's cold, it's dark, we, we can't see anything, we're just trying to find our way. He said, we might have gone around the grounds two times, maybe three. And he said, finally, we go and we, we go around again and we see the ambulance there at the loading dock. This would be the eight o'clock entrance uh, where they're, they take the casket and they take it up these steps. And they have to hold it high because there's a railing there that impeded everybody. And so they take it in. Now, the people that I had at the little conference I had in Chicago last year, they told me they took it to the hallway and left it. And then the, the morgue doors opened and somebody brought it in. Hmm. They, they came and pulled it in. Um, that's the 8 o'clock entrance. But we know from the account of Dennis David that he had given orders to unload a metal shipping casket with, that actually had the president's body about 635, 640. So, so that by the- We're looking at an hour and a half earlier, a shipping casket arrives with the president's body in, as opposed to this latter one around eight o'clock. I think the body got there about 20 minutes, the shipping casket arrived 20 minutes before the official ambulance, but the official ambulance sat out there for 12 minutes, I believe. So they sat out there for some time before anything was done. It's a, it's a very complicated thing, the, the ambulance arrivals. We do know that the president's body was taken in at 635 in a metal shipping casket. We know this because we've heard that from Dennis David and Roger Boygen, who was in charge of uh, the security detail going around the complex, I believe, and he kept a report of what he saw and what he did. So that, that's how we know that. And then there's the there's the uh, the entry for the uh, Secret Service agents Kellerman and Greer and Cybert and O'Neill. They give a time of bringing in the Dallas casket at 7:17. This is bizarre. It is bizarre, but I absolutely believe it happened. Yeah. Now, I have I have interviewed Jim Seibert some three times. I spent many hours with him. Um, I don't think he told me all he knew, but he told me a great deal. At one at one point, I I I can tell you the story of of uh, meeting him for the first time. Or do you want me to continue with the with the casket scenario? No, we can interject that story. I think it would be uh, actually give a nice little uh, a touch to it. And then we'll okay. continue with the casket. Okay, well, here's the deal. Uh, Jim Seibert and Francis X. O'Neill were given orders to stay with the body. Don't let the body out of your... Both guys. FBI agents. Yeah. Both FBI, they were given orders by J. Edgar Hoover. Stay with Kennedy's body. Whatever evidence is found in Kennedy's body, you are to take it and take it to the FBI laboratory. So... They, they stayed with the body, I believe, but, uh, but there was a point in the FD-302 that they wrote, they took about five and a half pages of notes, 
uh, where it says immediately there was a tight security placed around the facility. We had a conversation with, I think it was Rally about the matter, meaning they were kept out of the morgue. And that goes back to, that goes back to the complicit, uh, the, the complications with the casket entries because they couldn't let the FBI guys know that they already had the president's body in the morgue, so they had to keep them out, which is what they did. I wanted to clarify some of that when I went to, uh, went to see Jim Syru. And uh, how I did that, when I first called him up and I was working on the book, uh, this would have been about, I don't know, 98, I guess. And I called him up and uh, I felt that I had really connected with him and he was quite nice to me. And I couldn't get him to, to uh, let me come out and see him, but he said, you know, if you have a list of questions you want answered, I'll answer them. So I waited a week. I said, can I, do you have the number for Frank O'Neill? And so he went to his Rolodex and he got this number for Frank O'Neill. And after I got done with Cybert, I called O'Neill. And uh, he answered the phone, and he was real clipped, real short. And I said, I've, I've talked to your ex-partner, uh, Jim Seibert, and uh, I have this book I'm writing. I'd like you to be part of it. And uh, he said, well, as to an interview, I'll have to think about it. He said, but I'm going to call Jim. I'm going to call him right now. And he said, uh, as to an interview, I'll have to think about it. And he said, call me back in a week. So I called Seibert in a week. I'd gotten all the information on them that I could, had it fresh in my mind called him up and I said, you know, uh, it's me, Mr. Seibert, it's William Law, and there was silence on the phone. I said, you, you said you'd give me an interview or you would uh, answer some questions if I had them. Now, the, the agent had been very friendly to me, very nice, but this time he was like, yeah, well, I've decided not to do that. He said, I don't know. He said, it's all in the FD302, Frank and I did, then you'll just have to wait till all this comes out and uh, then you'll see it. And I said, well, I knew I was going to lose him, so I, I asked one question. I said, can I ask a question? So silence, and so I said, that night when you, were, uh, when you saw the body and you saw the autopsy pictures later, did, did the body look like what you remembered? And he said, it looked cleaner than what I remembered. I didn't see anything like that. So then I called Frank O'Neill, and he was even worse than Seibert, and he said, uh, I've decided not to give an interview. And I said, well, can I ask you just one question? He said, well, I've already told you I don't want to do an interview, but go ahead. So I said, when you saw the autopsy pictures at uh, the Records Review Board, did they look, did the president's body look like what you remember? And he said, some of them did, some of them didn't. Whoa. I, so, so I said, did the president, I pushed it. I said, did the president's body look like what you remember and he said no so that was it i used up my question so i hung up the phone now i continued to do the book but i continued to go ahead and interview the other people but it was just about ready to go to press and i thought you know i've got to try to get these fellas hmm just to say that I gave it my best shot. I really didn't have any hope that that was going to happen. So I found again where Seibert was living. Uh, actually, my editor found him for me. Uh, I called him up. And uh, did I get that backwards? It might have been O'Neill. I think it was O'Neill. I found O'Neill, and I called up O'Neill. This has been three years. So, and I was, I was half worried that he was going to pick up the phone because he was clipped and short and uh, half worried that he wouldn't. Well, it was him. And uh, I told him who I was, didn't vary anything, didn't lie about anything. I said, William Law, I'm doing this book. Uh, I had formed a plan that I had the, I had a couple of references to him in the, in the manuscript. So I used this as a catalyst to say, I've got a couple of references to you and I'd like you to check this for me. It was having to do with Gerald Custer, and he said, uh, Seibert and O'Neill were with me all the time. And, and so I asked him that, and, and when I called him, he said, yeah, this is Frank O'Neill. And he sounded maybe a little glad to hear from me. He started telling me about being a paratrooper in World War II. Uh, he told me about his life after that. Then he So he switched. warned up to you. Was he... he had he retired in between? Is that why? Do you think or he was? I, I don't know, but he maybe put he, some he distance was distance between his career and. I think I just hit him at the right time. Okay. Um, 
and he told me all this stuff. And uh, my last question to him in our first phone conversation was, you don't think there was any any uh, shenanigans about President Kennedy's assassination? No, he said, oh, no. He said, you know, the Kennedys would have spent every dime they had to find out. You know, Well, that went on, and I found different reasons to call him. And I warmed up to him pretty good. And at the end of it, I got to ask just everything I wanted to. He wouldn't come and he wouldn't come and let me see him. But he he did answer questions. And then then I went back to cyber and I, I did the same thing with cyber, not letting them know that I said I have been in touch with your uh, former partner. And he answered some questions for me. And I used the same technique. And I said, I've got these references in this book. Uh, it mentions your name. I'd like to clear this up. Uh, can you do that for me? He said, yeah, I can do that. So I started asking questions. I gave him my name, the whole thing, said just, just like three years before, and I guess neither one of them remembered me. So it all, it, all, it all wound up very well. And after a series of conversations with them both, um, I started sending cyber little gifts. I'd send him, I knew through conversations with him that, uh, that uh, he was into the assassination literature. So I sent him a couple of books on the assassination. And uh, he called me back a couple of days after he'd gotten them, and, and he said, you know, I wasn't expecting anything like this. Good night. And uh, I said, you know, I'm trying to write this book on you, and uh, I don't, uh, it's hard to write about somebody if you don't, if you haven't met them. And this was my last pitch. I said, if, if, uh, if I, there's some people down in your area that uh, were involved in this, and uh, if I ever get the opportunity to come your way, would you, would you mind if I came and saw you? Now, people had been writing to him for years and saying, you know, please give me an interview yeah. from yeah. college students to researchers. So I knew that I had to I had to have some different kind of pitch. So this was my pitch. After sending him gifts and talking to him for a number of months, I said, uh, would you mind if I could come and see you? And I, and I held my breath. And he said, no. And I thought in my head, boy, I've really blown this. And he said, no, I wouldn't mind. So, oh, wow. So you got it. Yeah. So yeah, between I, I, Seibert and O'Neill, when they told you their stories, was there any conflicts between their stories? Or they pretty much coincided with each other? The major conflict is this. Uh, 1978, before the House Select Committee, they gave depositions. And in those depositions, they said that they helped unload the casket. And there were there was Kellerman and Greer and O'Neill and Cyber. And they were the ones that unloaded the casket. Now, in later versions, after Best Evidence came out, David uh, Lifton's book. David Lifton's book. Yeah. Uh, I believe that Frank O'Neill had read this. And so he realized, ah, something is wrong here. So then when they were asked to go before the Records Review Board, he had said that they were there and present when they unloaded the casket with the honor guard. But Jim Cyber had been interviewed before Frank O'Neill. And Jim Cyber, being the Southern gentleman that he was, told the truth and said, there was Kellerman, Greer, me, and Frank O'Neill. So this threw up a red flag to the, to the uh, records review board, and so they questioned him about that. That was the major discrepancy. I should just tell folks before we go any further who Roy Kellerman was and uh, William Greer. William Greer was the driver of the uh, limousine that day, folks. And a Secret Service agent sitting right beside him was Roy Kellerman, another Secret Service agent. And their job was to stay with the body, um, <laughs> well, you know, when he was alive as well as yes. when he had passed on. So they were also inside Bethesda Hospital that day in the morgue when the autopsy was going on. So that's wh who those two guys are. Sorry to interrupt you. No, please. Fill it in. I can jump around here from time to time. No worries. So I get to, let's go back now to, I've got the interview. So I immediately booked a plane. And I call him up. I said, well, I'm going to go down your way. And uh, I told him the dates. And he said, well, that'll be fine. Come on down. And uh, at the time, I was working with uh, JFK Lancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took Deborah Conway with me. She, uh, I thought she could act as the document lady. And uh, so she came with me. We went to Florida. 
we, uh, I thought I heard uh, uh, Jim's voice as we were having breakfast. And uh, I got it from our table and I went and he was at the front desk and he was standing there, looked 20 years younger than his age, which was at the time somewhere in his early 80s, uh, uh, walked with a quick gait, dressed casually, straight back, white hair combed back, chiseled features, um, glasses, and we met and uh, he, he decided that he is going to take us to, to our rental car. So we all climb into his car. Deborah and I are sitting in the back seat. His wife, Esther, was sitting beside him, and he was doing the driving. Now, the one question I really wanted to focus in on was the brain. And I thought to myself, how am I going to ask this fella if there was a brain in President Kennedy's head when he saw the body? And I said something along the lines of, you know, Mr. Seibert, I'm so glad that, that I'm here with you because you had your hands on the body of the president, and you can answer so many things for me. And his dear little wife, Esther, turns around, and she looks at me, and she says, well, you know, his brains were all blown out of his head. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at the back of Jim's head. He didn't move. He didn't say anything. He just kept driving. And I, and I said to her, I, hope, I, I tried to keep my face calm, and I said, well, that was one of the questions I was going to ask. What pieces of the puzzle... Did those two guys, Siebert and O'Neill, what did they fill in for you that were missing? Mostly, well, let's, let's talk about the agents and the single bullet theory. Okay. When I talked to Frank O'Neill, he said to me somewhat angrily when I mentioned the, the uh, single bullet theory, he said, that did not happen. He said, they, the doctors came to that conclusion after the body was gone. What? And if, if they changed their mind on that, what else did they change their mind about? Uh, there's another thing that O'Neill said to me in a conversation. I've always wondered about uh, one of the driver. I guess it was the driver. I can't remember if it was Kellerman or Greer, claimed that he heard the president say, I'm shot, get me to a hospital. And I said, I don't think if you're, if you're hit and a bullet goes through your throat that you could say anything. And he said, I've often wondered about that myself, just in a kind of a, you know, kind of like between you and me off kind of cuff. voice, yeah. off the cuff. I've often wondered about that myself. Uh, their, their absolute insistence that the single bullet theory was not possible. Well, of course, if the single bullet theory, one bullet going through two men causing seven wounds and coming out unscathed on a stretcher or wherever uh, is not possible, then you have conspiracy. Exactly. They don't, right. and, and, but yeah. Frank didn't want to talk about that because when I would push him on it, he would tell me, well, you know, there was no conspiracy, but he would tell me things that would lead me in the other direction. Wasn't it Frank that said that um, they actually probed the back wound and it didn't go all the way through? Um, Was it Frank? Somebody else said that. May, I think somebody else said that. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, let's go to let's go to Jim Siren. Okay. Uh, we get into his office and he has many books on the assassination, and uh, I, uh, you know. Nobody had recorded him. He'd never been on camera. He had gone before these official bodies. But now I'm in, a, I'm in his office now in his home. And I'd come up with a little plan. And I said to Deborah before he came, I said, now, Deborah, I have a plan here. I said, what I want you to do is I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Seibert if I can camcord the conversation. And if he says no then I want you to take this little tape recorder. And I had a little mini tape recorder. I said, I want you to take this tape recorder and I want you to stick it in your purse. And then if he says no to my taping the session, I said, I want you to take this recorder out of your purse. And I want you to say, well, William, I have this recorder here if that will help you. And I said, if he still says no to that, then I just want you to sit in the corner and write as fast as you can. <laughs> so now I'm in his office. And he, he sits down at his desk, and I'm at a couch across from him. 
And he sits back and he puts his hands back here like this and he goes, well, who wants to write? So now here's my opportunity. So I start to go into my spiel. I say, Mr. Seibert, would you mind if I, uh, if I camcord this? And he says, no, go right ahead. I didn't bring a lot of fancy equipment. I didn't want to scare him. Uh, so I just brought a little uh, camcorder and I set it up on a pile of books and started it. And, I, and he started telling me what he remembered. And at one point, he, he disliked he disliked Specter or something terrible, Arlen Specter, the so-called father of the single bullet theory. The single bullet theory represented he the told, Warren Commission. Mm -hmm. Yes. He told me at one time, he said, uh, one, during one of our conversations, he said, he said Specter was a liar. He said, and he took his orders from above. Hmm. And how far above, I don't know. But he's he's reading this transcript that, that uh, they had when... Uh, when they did uh, an interview, uh, Spectre did this interview with O'Neill and, and Seibert, and he said, you know, he said, uh, he said in this report that I didn't make any notes, he said, I must have been a genius. He said, we took five and a half pages of notes. Yeah. And he, start, he starts reading through this thing, and uh, he, he just, uh, he said, you know, at the end of reading this, he says, you know, I've often wondered, whoever that marksman was, if he used an exploding bullet, now, I have him on tape saying that, so that doesn't really sound like Jim Seibert believed in the mm, single bullet single theory bullet or that theory. Oswald did it alone. Did he witness, what did he think the wound to the front of Kennedy's head was, an entrance wound or an exit wound? Well, I asked him about that, and I said, uh, let's go back to O'Neill. I'm questioning him about the, about the uh, pictures the autopsy pictures. I, I had them laid out and I was questioning him one by one on these. And I said, you know, th there appears to be, some people say there's damage to Kennedy's forehead. He said, and, and there's damage in these, in these photographs. And he said, well, there was no damage when I saw the body that night. Hmm. No way. Well, of course, now, and I asked the, I asked the same thing of Jim Seibert and he said, well, the, no, he said the, the forehead wasn't damaged. Um, but he did say, well, looking at the stair death photograph, nothing really looks looks uh, wrong with this. I can't see, you know, too much damage here. Um, but he didn't really comment on that. I, I assume you're talking about the V-shaped yeah, incision. Yeah, you know, kind of, yeah. <clears throat> well, no, let's, okay, this is really an interesting thing. The, the photographs that we have in the morgue of President Kennedy's yeah. body, most of those pictures are of President Kennedy's body his, and his head is in a, in a metal brace. Now, Paul O'Connor and Jim Jenkins and anybody else that I talked to and interviewed said they didn't remember the head being in a metal brace. Paul O'Connor and Jim Jenkins interviewed separately said that they used what is termed as a chalk block. It had different scallops in it, different, different depths, and you could, so you could move the, the thing around to put it wherever you needed to put it. He said, I don't remember any kind of brace. Nobody remembered that head brace. Hmm. Now, I'm going to jump forward here for a moment because we're talking about the pictures. When we first talked to Hugh Clark, uh, my film partner, and this is a man named Phil Singer, and he was responsible for getting some of the honor guard to come to a little get-together I had in uh, Chicago. And without asking, Hugh Clark said, I'm standing there guarding one of the doors, and at one time in the evening, I, I managed to look in. And he said it was only for five or ten seconds, but he said, I saw the president's neck on a block. So he didn't see the metal headrest either. He saw the president's head on a block. Now, we didn't tell him the significance of this. So when we gathered in Chicago, uh, he brought it up, and he said, I saw the president's head or neck on a block. And when we explained the significance of that, uh, to say that he was perplexed uh, is being gentle. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first person witness accounts. Order yours right now, nightfrightshow.com. What's your uh, conclusion on that? Do you think some people will remember it some way, some people remember it another way, or perhaps 
two geographically separate rooms. Well, you know, the more you talk to him, the more it almost sounds like there were, there were separate autopsies. Hmm. I, I'm not saying there was. I'm just saying it, it, it's so strange. You know, all we're trying to do here is connect the dots. Mm -hmm. And what I can tell you is I don't have the whole picture. I don't think any of us that have done work on this have the whole thing. But I think we're getting really close. I do believe that the president's body arrived at 635 in a metal shipping mm -hmm. cast. I do believe that the agents, the FBI agents and Kellerman and Greer took in a casket at 717. And I also believe that the president's body was put back into the Dallas casket and somehow gotten, aboard, gotten back in to the ambulance so that the honor guard could find it and bring the body in for the official autopsy. The only way that works is if Humes and Boswell and others higher up uh, knew that things were going to be done. And I think that they were given a scenario, uh, much like when Johnson pressured Warren hmm. into heading the Warren Commission. If you don't do this, Third this World could be War. the start of World War yeah. III. Ultimately, I, you know, Lamar Waldron writes in his book, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of his book. He's got several books out. Um, Ultimate Sacrifice. Ultimate Sacrifice, thank you. That he believes it was Bobby Kennedy up on the 17th floor at Bethesda pulling the strings down below in direct conversation with Admiral Berkeley, who was Kennedy's uh, personal physician. Do you follow that at all? Do you I don't. I don't disagree with him. Okay. But I don't, I don't think that... I think the real people involved in this that, that knew about this and gave those orders and told that story to those people were probably uh, that they knew he was going to be killed. Ah. I, I don't think it's all Bobby Kennedy. I think Bobby Kennedy inadvertently helped them hmm. muddy the waters because he didn't want the public to know about his brother's Addison's disease. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do agree that he muddied the waters a lot. I don't think he's the sole uh, person that that did this i want to talk about that back wound again to me that's where the magic bullet falls apart of course we touched on it briefly that's earlier where the back wound comes in uh, basically folks about six inches down from uh kennedy's neck kind of in the middle of the shoulder blades right then this 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 is where the bullet enters this is the magic bullet i'm talking about then it exits kennedy's neck goes into Connolly and creates five wounds, uh, two of them breaking bones, and then this bullet, of course, is found in Parkland Hospital in pristine condition. Uh, the movie JFK does a pretty good re re uh, right. rendition of that. Now, the problem with that is the angle is so steep that when it goes into Kennedy's back, the initial wound, um, it would have to hit something uh, to virtually shove it back upwards in a 90 degree angle and then if it does exit at Kennedy's neck as the Warren Commission wants us to believe the magic bullet it's going to be in an upward trajectory not a downward one so it would it when <laughs> this bullet even well, if it, we follow that would have uh, leapt right over uh, Governor Connolly's head so when we when I read in your book in the eye of history that they actually went through the back wound and the back wound they couldn't get more in an inch or so right and they could right. never follow follow through with it that it was closed wound i say well there it is right there there's no way this magic bullet could have happened irregardless well, if the if the neck wound was an entrance or an exit wound it just couldn't well, have happened i've already told you the statement of uh of frank o'neill yeah where he said that could not have happened jim seibert said that did not happen. I stood two feet from that back wound, and that back wound was too low in his back to come, go in, come out his throat, and go into Governor Conley's back. And that's where he, he got angry about uh, Gerald Ford uh, in later, uh, where they found Gerald Ford, not, not, to, uh, not to muddy the water, but for clarification, moved the back wound up from the shoulder to the neck. For clarification, in Mr. Ford's words, President um, Ford, as a matter of fact, later on. Yes, yes, yeah. later on, President Ford. So we have the two FBI agents, two trained people from the FBI, uh, with brains that can think and see for themselves. 
said the the single bullet theory did not happen. Jim Jenkins said after they had taken the 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 um, organs from the body, the they took a probe, and there's a lining that goes around your lungs, the pleural cavity, and he said a probe was put in, and you could see where the probe was pushing on the pleural cavity, on the on the membrane, and it did not go through the membrane. So the single bullet theory did not happen. If you don't have the single bullet theory, you have conspiracy. Bingo, right away. I want to jump to the head wound right away. Um, many people say there was very little brain missing. Uh, other people say there was a lot of brain missing. Some <clears> people <throat> say that there was x-rays showing fragments um, of, of bullets. Dr. David Mantic, our friend. Yeah. Uh, other yeah. people say there was no um, uh, evidence of fragments at all. Um, it, it's kind of tough to pull all this together. What is your final consensus after interviewing a lot of these great people that were there? Let's talk about let's talk about the AP, the frontal X-ray. Okay. In the in the frontal X-ray, when you have an autopsy, they they comb through the hair to make sure that they find if if you've been hit in the head with a bullet, they they comb through the hair to see if they find any bullet fragments. Now, in the in the skull X-ray, uh, you can clearly see a round object that has a little piece out of it. That just happens to be the circumference of a bullet coming from a uh, a 6.5 bullet coming from a Manlik or Carcano. The trouble is that it would have been on the outside of the skull, and there's there it was not when they combed the hair and they did it a lot. They found no bullet fragment that size. Um, nobody remembers, nobody I've questioned, the FBI agents who saw the x-rays that night, Jim Jenkins who saw the x-rays, Paul O'Connor who saw it that night, did not see that so-called uh, fragment piece of bullet uh, that night. That showed up, I think, in 1968 when the Clark panel uh, was looking at the x-rays, and all of a sudden here's this piece of... Uh, piece of bullet with uh, arrows pointing all around it. Yes, here it is pretty here much. it is here it is <laughs> and now david mantic now he he i don't i can't explain all of his research but i think to explain it from his point he took these x-rays he's visited the archive some nine times mm -hmm. he he took instruments in with him he did what's called optical densitometry i think where you measure the light that goes through the x-ray and that tells you mm -hmm. you know uh, whether there's been monkey business with with uh, with the X-ray, and <clears throat> through these studies and through what he did, he says that that area in the back of the skull has has a white patch over it that is too dense, and that that they have copied these things. The what we're looking at is not from the originals. Uh, recently, a man named uh, Dr. Mike Chesser has followed in Dr. Mantic's footsteps. And he concurs step for step uh, by uh, Mantic saying that he got it right. He did the same thing. And he looked at these things and he said, these are copies. They are not originals. Mm. So we have, we have forgery in the, in the x-rays. There's forgery all around this thing. Yeah. We, have, we have forgeries of the x-rays. <clears throat> we have aut autopsy pictures with the president's head. Uh, in a in a metal head brace that was not seen that night, we have uh, three different casket entries. One at 6:45 or 6:35, a metal cheap metal shipping casket where the where the president's body was unloaded. Uh, we have the 7:17 entry from Cybert and O'Neill, and then we have the official entry uh, at 8 o'clock uh, from the honor guard. Uh, it, it's either one or the other. You can't have it all. But I do believe that all that happened. I believe those things happened. You, I can't come to any other conclusion because when you're sitting across from a fellow that was there that night, and I'm looking into his eyes, and he tells me these stories, yeah. and I've done this with every witness, yeah. they're telling me the truth. They're telling me what they know. What they remember. And Jim, yeah. Jim Jenkins probably at the was the most reluctant person. I had to track him down. I had to go to him. And it took me years 
to to really gain his confidence. We've become very close friends now, uh, 18 years later. Uh, but he didn't know me from Adam when I first approached him about this. And so we are doing research together. We are uh, doing a book together. And uh, a lot of this stuff is going to get clarified. We'll, we're going to be bringing it out within the next year or so. What are some of the other crazy things that um, just don't make sense uh, that you've uncovered? I mean, you, you interviewed virtually everybody that was standing beside the president, around the president that night. Um, there was okay. Some people say there was uh, an x-ray machine. Some people say it wasn't an x-ray machine. They don't recall that. Again, maybe uh, giving evidence that perhaps there was two autopsies that happened. Gerald Custer told me that he used what they called an old PACO unit that was a portable x-ray machine. And now the trouble with Gerald's story is that uh, he gave me a different version than he gave Sylvia Chase in 1988. Uh, so he had changed his story a little bit. And when you do that, you tend to ruin your credibility. But Custer was an angry man. Um, he felt that he had been taken advantage of by uh, researchers over the years. And uh, that was quite evident. And, and, and uh, he was only 20 years old when he was standing beside the president. Right, right. And uh, just a young the, son, I think. He, the, the, he died from a heart attack. Uh, and I talked to his wife, and it was just tragic, uh, where he had, he had just enough time to say goodbye to her before he passed. And uh, I really didn't know what to say. Uh, the interesting thing is that some weeks later, a man that he was doing a book with died of the same thing in the same hospital. That shook me up a little bit. Uh, I'm not a person that looks for a conspiracy, uh, but there are certainly shady things in this case. I can and ask that, you this right away, William. Have you had some strange things happen to you, some cloak and dagger? No, I really can't. I really can't say that I have. But, you know, I've been doing this for so long. You know, they probably think, you know, it's been 50 some years now and, uh, you know, they can discredit you. They don't kill you anymore. They just discredit you. So uh, I think they think I'm pretty low on the totem pole if there's anybody out there watching. And uh, they're right. I am. So please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't bring, want to bring misfortune upon you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how much time we have, but you said some of the craziness. You want to know some of the other things? Yeah, we've got a bit the time. brain. Yeah, go ahead. Paul O'Connor said that the brain was blown out of the head, that there was maybe half a handful of brain. When I asked, uh, when I asked uh, Frank O'Neill about this, he said, well, there was a good section of brain, a good portion of brain there, a wedge, <laughs> which, is, which means most of it's blown out. Uh, we had the statement from from Jim's wife who had, who blurted out, well, you know, his brains were all blown out of his head because, of course, Jim Seibert went home that night and said, Esther, guess what? I was at the president's autopsy and his brains were gone. Now, there's this, there is Jim Jenkins who said, I was handed a brain that night to infuse. And he said, the, he said, I heard one of the doctors say, the damn thing fell out in my hand. And I now I've never interviewed Jim Jenkins before. Now I'm sitting in a little room with him. He's sitting across the table from me and he says, the doctor said the damn thing fell out of my hand. I almost fell off my chair. It means it was probably I, severed, right? I tried to I tried to act like I hear this kind of thing all the time. And I said, uh, what does that mean to you? And he said, well, I think that means that the brain was removed and then replaced. Told you folks, he, explosive revelations tonight. There you go. There's another one. So <laughs> it's, you know what? All I, you always get in this, if, if you're reading somebody else's book, it's always, I can tell you what happened. I can tell you exactly what happened. I got tired of that kind of thing, reading that. I wanted to speak to people who would just tell me the story. Exactly. I had, I had no no thought that I was going to solve the case, that I was really going to find out any. I just wanted to know for myself, was there a conspiracy in the death of John F. Kennedy? I got more than I bargained for, I can tell you that. Now, another great coup you had was the fact that you were able to interview Doug Horn, who never offers 
anybody, and God knows I tried, <laughs> and interview Doug. <laughs> well, I think it's it, it's probably <clears throat> it's probably because, and I think it's volume three or four Was it the of his five. Bucks he offered him or the trip to Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I probably would have tried that had I not been successful. But <laughs> when I got a set of his books, uh, he had taken about 18 pages right out of my book because he was told when he was with the Records Review Board, you are not allowed to get a hold of Jim Jenkins nor Paul O'Connor. You cannot speak to these men. So he found my book and used my interviews with O'Connor and Jenkins to fill out uh, portions of his book. Now, I don't mind that at all. I did this book in that way so that people could use could use that. But I did I did uh, when I thought uh, I was going to put out a new edition. I did ask Doug for a, for an interview because I thought his work was so important that I had to get him to talk to me. And so I emailed him and he and he did uh, he did uh, agree to an interview and he gave me a lengthy one and a long one and we've since become. Very good friends. What were some of the revelations that he gave you that you were unaware of? Because let's remember, folks, the uh, the movie um, JFK came out in 1992, and because of that, uh, the administration decided to set up something called the ARRB, which was the Assassination Records Review Board. Doug Horn, who Williams interviewed, was on that records review board, so he was in, in inner circle. And, he was, uh, and William, oh, kudos, buddy, uh, was able to interview him. What kind of things did he tell you that you were unaware of? Let me tell you where he was really helpful to me. Okay. He was in the catbird seat of history. Yeah. When, when he was there for the depositions of Humes, Boswell, and Fink. Can you tell folks real quick who those guys are? Humes and Boswell and Fink were the were the autopsy people. They were the prospectors, prospectors, uh, and he gave wonderful, wonderful descriptions of Boswell and Humes and Fink. Just they came off the page. It uh, he gives this wonderful story about talking to Fink, who was a very nervous person and kept putting lip balm, some sort of thick, waxy stuff on his lips. And at one point uh, during uh, their questioning, he gets up from his chair and takes a leg and bends it back and starts hopping up and down on one leg because he had a bad knee. Uh, he talks about Humes uh, being, uh, lack of a better word, disgruntled. Mm -hmm. When they started touching on things, he didn't He didn't want to answer. He uh, he. In, in Horn's words, he acted like a man with something to hide. I believe that Dr. Humes did have something to hide. He hid the fact that he did indeed know about this and probably did some of the alteration on the body himself. Now, mm. I hate to talk about other people's research because I haven't thoroughly looked into it myself, but I can tell you that he's probably right about that. I think that Humes probably did have a hand in it. I, at least, at the very least, he knew what was going on that night. I'm absolutely convinced of it. And he, there's a reason that he was the one that that did the final report. You know that mm. uh, he did it, in, and then he burned Humes burned the, the his autopsy notes and his first draft of the notes and the first signed report. He burned those. Um, so why would he do that? Yeah. And then, then there's the story of uh, Fink not being able to find his notes right after the autopsy. He goes to wash his hands, and uh, it was found out later this fellow was uh, having lunch in the same lunchroom as Fink and a couple of other people, and he said, I couldn't find my notes. He said, they disappeared. I had to, I had to write them down from memory. I think the guy that told that story was a man named Slauson. And so I believe that he probably took his notes and he got rid of them because it wasn't showing what what needed to be put into the report. So I think that Humes got that and burned that too. Uh, and if you read, I have this testimony in in the back of uh, 
the new section of my book, and you can read that. I it's was going like to ask you when you're speaking when you were speaking with Doug Horn from the A A A R R B. Um, was he stymied it at all by the government? In other words, were they trying to still hold back files that they were supposed to be releasing there, to him to have evaluated? Well, the, the, there's the little matter of the Secret Service, who, when they were requested to give their trip files, uh, I think for September, October, and November, they were told not to touch them, uh, leave them alone. The Secret Service burned them and got rid of them. Yeah, isn't that coincidental? Isn't that coincidental? And after and being told specifically not to do a to, thing, they go ahead them and do alone. it anyways. They, they burn them. Why would they do that? Mm. The, the fact is, is, look, if this case is so simple that Lee Harvey Oswald, a lone malcontent, took a rifle and shot at a man in a car and killed him, why do we have all this discrepancy? Why do we have nothing straight from the time the body hits Parkland Hospital, where the doctors all agree that he was shot from the front and a bullet was coming at him, that the cerebellum, which sits in the very back of the head, is oozing onto the cart. Another doctor said it was That's literally swinging in the breeze. We have, I don't know how much time we have left. We've only got a, a minute. Well, there's, there's all kinds of complications from John Stringer, who took the pictures of the brain, supposedly there's two different brain exams uh, on, on different days uh, that are both supposedly of President Kennedy. The only trouble, John Stringer says that he didn't take any bottom views of the brain, the basilar views of the brain. He said these half of this uh, collection is basilar views, and I only shot views from the top, and it's not the right kind of film that I used. Papers, the paper is different. So why do we have those discrepancies? You know, why do we have the president's head in a metal headrest when no headrest was seen by anybody? Do you think they we're going to get block. answers? You know, Hillary's talking about releasing UFO files. I would, I, I, I would suggest the JFK files are a little bit more important, uh, you know. I agree with you. So that, I mean, if there was a coup d'etat and there was a change of government by bullets, I, I think the American people have a right to know. I think the world has a right to know because things have been altered. And I'm, I'm hopeful that she will realize this too. If she's gonna release UFO files, release the damn Kennedy files first. Well, I agree with you. This was the, this was the point where we no longer trusted our government. Mm -hmm. And it's carried through all these decades. This is where it started from. In Jim Jenkins' words, he said, I was 19 or 20 years old when I found out my government was no better than a third world country. Yeah. And he said, I don't trust the government, and I don't trust people, and this is where it started. Exactly right. We the people. Folks, the book is called In the Eye of History, Disclosures in the JFK Assassination Medical Evidence, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on the book cover. There's the music, and get it at a store near you or just order it online from the comfort of your own home. William Matson law has been our guest. Thank you so much, my friend. I enjoyed it, Brent. Thank you. Me too. Thank you. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. Sorry I'm late. Take care. Bye-bye. Inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza. First person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com.